We have been on a journey through Ephesians chapter, uh, well, the whole book. We just finished Ephesians chapter 4. Today, we're going to dip our toes into the first two verses of Ephesians 5. But let me give you a little bit of a context. Uh, we'll, we'll read sort of the, the last little bit of a, a, a chunk uh, or series that we have been uh, in. If you found your way to Ephesians chapter 4... Then uh, I'll read to you starting in verse 20. We'll go through this relatively quickly, but you can begin to get a sense of what Paul is talking about in this, in this moment or this portion of this letter to the church in Ephesus. And so far he's told us, hey, remember who you are in Christ. And then in, in chapter 4, verse 20, he says, but, but all of the different ways, the way the world lives, that's not how you came to know Christ, assuming you knew that you have heard about him, you were taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus, uh, to take off your former way of life, the old self that's corrupted by deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. That's a good encapsulation of a challenge that Paul is giving us through this whole letter. Put off the ways of the world, put on the ways of Christ. Assuming that you know what the gospel is, live according to the gospel. He goes on, and he says, this is what that should look like. Therefore, putting away lying, speaking truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another, be angry and do not sin, and don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you. And as if to put an exclamation mark on all of that that he just said, Paul writes what we'll be studying today in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. May God, as we continue in this journey through this book, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us, speak through me today. Anything that's just my ideas, would you uh, just strike that down, cause us all to completely forget anything that's just me, and uh, empower us to be able to hang on to what your Holy Spirit would say to this church today, in Jesus' name. Amen? So Paul is is what he's doing here. He's, he's masterfully bringing all of this. This is how you should live. He's bringing our focus all the way back around to Jesus. He's saying, in light of all of this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imitate God. Now, today I have a little bit of a holiday weekend gift for you. My sermon only has two points. You're welcome. But just so you know, point one has three sub points. Okay. So I got you there. But I only have two points today, I promise. Uh, today I just want to unpack the implications of what Paul is saying to us in this one sentence. Uh, and if you've done any journeying with us, if you've been here for this series, you've read any of Paul's writing, you know he can say a ton in a sentence. And I think he has done exactly that all over again in this. The first thing that Paul challenges us to do, you've already heard it, he says this, be imitators of God. Paul really says two main things here, and this is the first one. He says, be an imitator of God. Now, it, it would be helpful here if we just kind of call time out for a second and remind ourselves of the context of who Paul is actually writing to. So the people of the city of Ephesus uh, were in a, in a portion of, of history where the, in, and in a place in the world where they were living in a very influential community. It was a port city, and at the time that was wildly important. It was one of the most influential cities in the region at that time, and it was wildly influenced by the world around them because the cultures and the beliefs of other places were coming in to do trade, and so religions would kind of come from other places and hang around in Ephesus. There was a, a lot of 
uh, what we would call pagan worship of, of all kinds of different gods, and there was all kinds of different practices, and there were particular uh, pagan worship practices that, because I think we've got a couple of young people in the room I won't get into, but these are the sorts of things that you shouldn't uh, be doing if you're not married, and they would do this as acts of worship. Tracking with me? Okay, good. All right, so a, a concerning kind of place, a problematic environment, and this is the kind of place where the, now there's a group of Christians, and the church is growing in Ephesus, and Paul is writing to them to say, in the world that you're living in, hang on to the truth. Don't let the world around you, the cultures around you, steal you away from the kingdom of Jesus. And I wonder if any of us can relate to that. Living in a world that is influenced, connected to all of the other belief systems around the world. Have you turned on the news? Have you ever been on social media? Have you ever had a conversation? We live in a place that is increasingly hostile for people who stand up and say, I believe every word of scripture, right? And this is what it would feel like to live in Ephesus, and it's what it feels like for us, that in movies and TV and social media, in news and in the cultural beliefs that are shifting more and more away from biblical truth, we are called to hold on to our faith, and that's challenging. So the book of, Ephes uh, of Ephesians, written to the Christians in Ephesus, is also written for us all these years later, living in the Antelope Valley, living in Southern California. Uh, Pastor John Tyson can also relate to this. He pastors a, a, a church called Church of the City in New York City, another place where it's hard to be a Christian in public. And he actually says what happens when a culture is particularly worldly is it begins to put pressure on the church to conform to its image. And doesn't it feel a little bit like that's what's happening? There was a day, I don't know that I've been alive during this cultural moment, but there was a day, at least in the West, when the Christian church had tons of cultural influence. And what the Christian church said kind of set the tone for the culture. And because we had cultural influence and power, we were able to say, this is the way that you should live, and everyone just sort of fell in line with that. And maybe you have some feelings about how that was and how it is now and how we got to where we are and whether any of that is good and bad. But the point is that now we seem to have had the tables turned on us. Where now the people with cultural power are actually outside of the church and they're putting pressure on us to conform to their culture. And so Paul comes in and he says, I want you to be imitators of God. In a world that is increasing the pressure for you to imitate the world, God says, imitate me. That's easier said than done. But we must do the work. Amen? So this is not just a, an ancient problem that Paul and his friends in Ephesus had. This is our problem. So we have to ask the question, how do we actually be imitators of God? What does this actually look like? Well, in another letter, Paul writes to the Christians who live in Rome. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he, he says this same idea. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of of God. And then just a little bit later in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, uh, Paul then actually writes, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. So again, friends, our goal is to be imitators of God. And this same author, Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell the Christians in Ephesus to be imitators of God, was also inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell the Christians in Rome to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and put off the world. How in the world do we put off the world? We've got to find out how to resist uh, the old enemies of the church, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've got to figure out how to hold off the devil and center our lives on Christ. Or as Paul says to the Christians in Rome, and he says to us today, put on the Lord Jesus, making no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. 
Um, by the way, I, I think Paul does give us a little bit of a clue for how we do this in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, think again about what he says, therefore be imitators of God, and then he gives us a little bit of a disclaimer, as dearly loved children. Well, think about the people that you've looked up to. The mentors in your life, maybe you have had the kind of relationship with a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a teacher or a leader in your life that you would say, you know what, I want to emulate that person. When I was thinking about this idea of being as dearly loved children, I was reminded of the ways that I, I once had a mentor in my life, and I think I've told you this story before. If you've, if you've been around, you might have heard this, but I, I had a mentor in my life. His name was Chad. He used to be the youth pastor here at the church, and, uh, and just a phenomenal guy, and really took, took a, a kind of a big brother, almost like a fatherly role in my life in a season where I really was struggling with my relationship with my dad and, and my relationship with God as a father, and, and, and this guy had a a particular style and a particular way of talking and, and kind of carrying himself. And I remember one day uh, he had such, had such an influence in my life uh, that I actually started to talk like him. And I was sitting at the breakfast table with my mom one day. Some of you have met my mom, and so uh, you're going to not be so surprised by this that you've heard my mom say stuff like this. Where, well, we're sitting at br the breakfast table one day, and I was telling a story, and, and I was talking, and, and she goes, you know, you talk now just like Chad. And I went, wow, Mom, thank you so much. And she goes, no, it's annoying. You should stop. <laughs> and I, I, I was taken aback by that. She said, I'm not saying Chad's not a good guy. He hasn't had a wonderful impact on your life. She's saying, but you're not Chad. Be who God's created you to be. And there's something interesting there that what she began to teach me was what it looks like to do what Paul said to his own disciples, to follow me as I follow Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to dress like Paul and talk like Paul and look like Paul and act like Paul. You're supposed to follow the way that Paul follows Jesus. And that doesn't mean that if I'm your pastor and a mentor in your life that you have to dress like me and look like me and talk like me and act like me. Hopefully, when you hang around me, you act more like yourself and Jesus. And so my mom had to tell me, hey, stop talking like Chad. Chad's a wonderful human being, but be yourself and be like Christ. And let Chad point you to Jesus, not to Chad. And that wasn't anything he was doing wrong. I just misunderstood what it meant to be an imitator of God. So get a mentor, hang around people who act like Jesus, but make sure that you're imitating who? The answer is, is, is God, right? The answer is Jesus, okay? So get a mentor and, 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 and follow their lead and all of that, but make sure you're, you're imitating. Okay, good. All right. Whew. All right. Make sure, make sure I land the plane on that, on that lesson. Now, here, here, is, here is a clarifier, though, is... Spiritual maturity does not mean you become less impressionable. Uh, I think we actually have this idea that we, we think that uh, if I'm spiritually mature, that I'm not impressionable anymore. I'm secure. I know everything about who I am. The reality is the more mature I become, the more impressionable I actually become. The question is who is making an impression on me? Be imitators of God. I want to be wildly impressionable. I just want God to have a say in the way that my life is being molded. And I think the question for us is, who is molding your life? Another way to say this would be to make a claim. The claim would be this. You are being discipled. You have always been being discipled. The question is, who is discipling you? I remember as a pastor the grief when I discovered the light bulb went on. I had an aha moment. Oh, my goodness. A lot of people that I know are being discipled by the news more than the Bible. Being discipled by social media more than their own pastor. That's terrifying. Here's, here's the reality. You are wildly impressionable, and I celebrate that. Just make sure that you know that that means that it is very, very important that you're being impressed upon by the right person. Amen? Just be impressionable but be impressed by God. Have a singular focus on Jesus, or as Paul says in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But again, how does this actually happen? How do we actually do this? You see, to imitate God requires that we frame our lives in such a way that over time we look more and more like Jesus. Or another way to say this is over time we increase the focus of Christ as the center of our lives. And the more that you can frame your life in such a way that Christ is the center of your life, the less all of that other stuff around the world that wants to impress upon you the culture of the world, the the less that that becomes interesting to you. The more I focus on Jesus, the less the world is appealing to me. So how do I do that? Well, I have to build my life according to a helpful framework. I just want to take some time, and, and, and this is where my three sub-points are going to come in. So we're going to see if we can move through these relatively quickly. And this is all to say one thing. I want to present to you an idea for a framework that I think would be helpful for you, that if you want to center your life on Christ, you could live according to these three things. And we're just going to put a, a picture up on the screen uh, for you. Now, this, this picture for you is something called the Golden Triangle of Spiritual Growth. What a fancy name. Now, if you've heard me uh, talk about a guy named Dallas Willard a little bit, I have referenced him quite a bit. He actually uh, popularized this framework, and you can read about it uh, in his book called The Great Omission. But this, this golden triangle of spiritual growth is simply this. It is to say this, that if you have these three elements in your life, it will help you build a framework that will center your life on Christ. So let's walk through what these three are. The first one is that Willard would say that we have to remain as remain faithful in the midst of ordinary events of life. And some of the ordinary events of your life, by the way, are trials and temptations. Raise your hand if you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, you've never been tempted to sin. Exactly. This is an ordinary part of our lives. We have an enemy who wants to draw us away from Christ. We have a world who wants to draw us away into the culture of the world. And trials are also an ordinary part of life. And what it looks like to remain faithful is to resist temptation and give thanks to God even in the midst of trials. In fact, James writes about that in James chapter 1. He says, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What James is telling us here is you can be thankful when you go through difficult seasons because if you endure, you will come out on the other other end looking more like Jesus. St. Ignatius would refer to this as the dark night of the soul, that all of us are at some point going to go through at least once, maybe multiple times if you hang around long enough, through seasons of darkness. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus and you've experienced going through seasons of doubt and you're not so sure if maybe you're crazy for believing this thing called the gospel and you know what it feels like to maybe have to deconstruct some of the problematic things that you started out believing and coming out the other side believing more in the truth of the Bible and not like the culture's version of Christianity or, or, or not just your grandma's Christianity but your personal relationship with Jesus. If you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, you know what it feels like to go through what Ignatius called the dark night of the soul. And Willard says, remain faithful in that season. This is like the disciples who were in the boat and the storm comes to the boat and they're afraid that they're going to lose their life. And remaining faithful in the middle of the trial is to do, even in their doubt and their fear, what the disciples did. They ran and found Jesus who was at rest in the boat. And we can critique the way they did it, and Jesus stood up and asked where their faith was. Well, their faith was in the person they ran to. So maybe they had some misunderstandings, but they at least ran to the right place. This is what it looks like, remaining faithful, holding fast. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, and, and in that book he refers to something that he calls the law of undulation. Undulation just means this kind of like ebb and flow. You can think of like how water, the ocean undulates. It goes up and down. And he would talk about how uh, our lives have natural peak mountaintop moments and, and trough or valley moments. Mountaintop and valley. Highs and lows. Your life had naturally goes through 
high experiences and low experiences. You've all been living long enough to know that that's a reality of life right now. And God would call us to hold on to him in faithfulness through all of that. And if you can manage to do that, then you will be the kind of person who can say, I have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when trials and temptation comes, the Lord Jesus Christ does not come off of me. And I don't lay him down just because life got hard or confusing. How do you imi imitate God? You hang on to him through it all. I mean, this is what Jesus does in the garden before he goes to the cross, right? Jesus himself, I'm not so sure I'm enjoying this anymore, Dad. But nevertheless, what does he say? Your will be done. So you imitate the one who hung on even through his own dark moment. Much, much more could be said about that, but because I want to get you out of here before the fireworks start this week, Let's move on to the second one. Uh, the second point of this triangle would be what we see at the top. And we would say that the call here is to live in submission to the action of the Holy Spirit in your life, around your life, and through your life. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is doing, to be submitted to that. And we could break down the whole theology, and we won't take a ton of time to do this right now. But just so that we remember, the Holy Spirit is equally God, just as much as Jesus the Son is God, just as much as the Father is God. Uh, they are a part of the, the triune Godhead, which are all equally God, and have they're all one person, God, with three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with all distinct functions and roles while all simultaneously being God. If you understand everything that I just said, you're part of the Trinity. So if that's confusing a lot, it's, it's cool. Join the human race. But what we understand about the Holy Spirit is he has a, he has a specific job. He was sent by Jesus. When Jesus was, he ascended to the Father, where he now sits praying for the saints, and the Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to be a helper, an advocate, the one who comes alongside us, the one who empowers us. And what we're called to, if we want to center our life on Jesus, or put on the Lord Jesus Christ, is to be people who are submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, what he's doing around our lives, and through our lives as he empowers us. And what this practically looks like is it looks like the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are, there's, there's a bunch of them, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine of them listed. For example, they are words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. We've done an entire sermon series on what all of those mean. You can check that out on our podcast or on YouTube. But the gifts of the Spirit are outward expressions of the power and the love of God moving through our lives. For the record, you cannot function in the gifts of the Spirit unless you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, which is another sermon I won't take time to talk about, but wouldn't it be good for you to spend some time figuring out what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that he can, through your life, minister the gifts of the Spirit to the world around you. And then there's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the inward development of maturity over time. So the more you walk with Jesus, the more the fruit of the Spirit can be expected in your life. The fruit of the Spirit can be seen in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <sighs> Here's the point of all of that. I know it feels a little bit like I might be fire hosing you with information right now. The point of all of that is that the Holy Spirit empowers us to become more like and live more like Jesus. So in whatever it looks like, the fruit of the Spirit growing, in, growing you up in maturity, the gifts of the Spirit ministering through you in power, whatever it looks like, to be submitted to the Holy Spirit is to do the work to frame out my life so that everything is centered on the person of Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is always going to point people back to Christ for the purpose of salvation and bringing the kingdom into the world and bringing you back into the kingdom when you feel like you are far from God. It is the Holy Spirit even that convicts us of sin, illuminates scripture, so we submit to whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. So again, to live as imitators of Christ, we need to 
be faithful through trials. We need to submit to the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing is that we practice spiritual disciplines. So you can see there down at the bottom, planned discipline to put on a new heart. Planned discipline. You don't stumble your way into spiritual discipline. Like, have you ever stumbled your way into a six-pack? Uh, abs, not the other one. Um, I, got, I got to the end of that illustration and realized it was not helpful. <laughs> Some people have stumbled their way into the wrong kind of six-pack. Have you ever stumbled your way into a six-pack? I have not. I have not actually stumbled my way into either one of those, just for the record. One takes much more work than the other one. And this is the point. Dallas Willard makes this point, that spiritual disciplines are works of our will, things that we do because we want to, so that tomorrow we can do the thing that is hard for us to do now. If you go to the gym and you lift 10 pounds today, that might be hard. But if you keep coming back and lifting 10 pounds, eventually it won't be hard for you to lift 10 pounds. And the reason you lifted 10 pounds for 30 days in a row is so that on day 21, you can lift 20 pounds. Does this make sense? It's the same with our spiritual discipline. It's so that over time we can do the things that look more and more like Jesus if he were living our life. So these are, again, practices that a disciple of Jesus engages to allow the Holy Spirit to grow us more into the image of Christ over the course of our lifetime. Now, when talking about spiritual disciplines, I actually find it really helpful to show you another picture. So there's, there's a picture here of uh, one of my favorite bridges in the world that I've never been to, but it sure is beautiful. Now, this is the Olympic Bridge in Seoul, Korea. When the, when the Olympics were in, in Seoul, they actually built this bridge specifically for, uh, to celebrate the, that event. And if you look closely, you can see that that is it looks a lot like a torch at the top of it, right? And there's traffic that goes over. There's foot traffic and car traffic that goes over this bridge now. It's a functional bridge every single day of the week. I haven't figured out yet. I've, I've actually several times used this illustration and tried to figure out how many people actually cross over that bridge all the time. But here's the illustration, is that this bridge serves as an image of your life. And there's all kinds of traffic going on over your life. And the goal is that your life kind of looks like it's got the torch of the gospel of Jesus Christ shining up above it. We want your life to be beautiful and attractive, and we want people to think your life is so attractive, I'd be willing to travel to go and spend some time and figure out what it is that's so wonderful and beautiful about you, right? The gospel of Jesus should be attractive in our lives, and that's all great. But now, the next image is going to show us the important thing that's going to link us back to spiritual disciplines, This is now a picture of the same bridge from a very different angle. And you're making the right face. It doesn't look pretty anymore. For the record, the face was, that's not beautiful anymore. Go back to the other, go back to the other picture. Beautiful, glorious, wonderful. And someone stood way down there in the daytime and took the next picture. Under the bridge, it's not beautiful, but this is the image of your spiritual discipline. Because it's the things that you do routinely that strengthen your life. It's the things that you do that no one else is seeing, that isn't in public Christianity for everyone to see the beauty of your faith. It's the stuff that you do in private, routinely, every day, that is strong, that holds you up, so that all of the life of God that he wants to have happen going back and forth over the top of your bridge can actually be sustainable. Because if the bottom of the bridge is weak and malformed, then over time, all of that traffic and life, no matter how good it looks that runs over the top, will wear down the bridge and destruction will be inevitable. Spiritual disciplines is not an option, friends. It's the thing you do so that your life can be strong and your faith will not fall apart. It's the thing that you do that says, when I put on Christ, I practice these disciplines. I do these things. I live in this way and I resist these other things so that when the trial comes or so that when the Holy Spirit leads, I can follow and I won't give up. 
And here's, here's the whole point, is that we are, we are practicing spiritual disciplines like fasting and prayer and daily Bible reading. And we are submitted to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, moving into all kinds of radical places. And, and we, are, we are fully committed to Christ no matter what comes for this purpose so that we can say, I am imitating God. Because I'm not just trying to look like the world. And I'm not just trying to let the world tell me what I should look like. I'm rooted deeply in Scripture, filled and led by the Holy Spirit. And I won't give up no matter what comes. I'm imitating Christ. The goal of our disciplines is to discipline our lives so that over time we find it increasingly more possible to put on Christ and live as He would if He were us. And then now remember all of these three things, faithfulness in the middle of ordinary life events, submission to the action of the Holy Spirit, and spiritual disciplines. All of them are needed. In fact, Willard will conclude this portion of of this talk on a quote from Dallas Willard himself. He says, the three sides of the golden triangle of spiritual growth belong together. No one of the three will give us a heart like Christ's without the other two. None can take the place of any other, yet each connected to the others will certainly bring us to ever-increasing Christ-likeness. Now, I would just like to clarify that what Dallas Willard proposed for us is not itself scripture. And so don't, don't go walking around saying like, well, if you don't do the thing that Dallas Willard said exactly the way Dallas Willard says it, like he's just a guy and he didn't write the Bible. But frameworks are helpful for us, right? So I wanted to present that to you for this purpose so that we can find in Scripture a healthy and helpful way to live. Amen? All right. So this is how we imitate God. We resist the ways of the world. We discipline our lives, learning to live like him as if he were living our lives in our body, in our moment And being filled with the Holy Spirit, receiving his power, exercising gifts, and developing his fruit in our lives over time. And as we do this, now we can come back to Ephesians. As we live like this, we can say, yeah, I'm doing this. I am an imitator of God as a dearly loved child. I look up to God so much that I want to be more like him. But then remember that Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse, what we have as verse 2 in the second half of this sentence. He says, and walk in love. As Christ also loved us, gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. And so Paul challenges us to imitate God as dearly loved children. And number two, he calls us to walk in love. And just for the record, this is not just Paul's idea by himself. This idea is all over Scripture. Let's just look at a couple of places just in the New Testament alone where we are called to love. Jesus says in John 13, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, do everything in Love. Ephesians 4, we studied this several weeks ago. Walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Colossians 3.14, above all put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. 1 Peter 4.8, above all maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. And 1 John 4.7 in one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In short, love God and love people. In fact, that's one of the things that Jesus says everything hangs on that. Will you love God and love people? And if you don't do that, here's here's what the full counsel of Scripture teaches us. If you cannot love you're not a Christian. This probably isn't a point for you because you're wonderful, awesome, loving people. But like, you know those folks who just come to church and then say, because I went to church, I'm a Christian? I know that not any of you. But there are those of us who say, well, I went to church a couple times a month, once a month. I even went on a Wednesday. And that's what makes me a Christian. We understand that's not actually what makes you a Christian. A life of discipleship 
submitted to the Holy Spirit, holding fast to your faith through all kinds of trials, committed to walk in love. This is what it looks like to be a Christian, not whether or not you attended church on a Sunday. Now, I'll say you should attend church on a Sunday because like Pastor Mark said earlier, this is the staff meeting where we get the memo for how we can love God and love people well. And if you're not in the context of community, you're also not in the context of the community called the church. Anyway, that's a different sermon. Just, you know, keep attending church. It's not probably a sermon that you need to hear, but you should come. But that's not what makes us Christians, right? Listen again to what Paul calls us to as he tells us to love. This is what it looks like. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. This is what it looks like to live in his kingdom, that we would love the way God loved us. I think to walk in love means two things. We're covered by the love of God, like we receive love, but it also means that we give love away to others. So, relatively quickly, let me just answer the question for us. What does it look like for us to love others? Well, Jesus loved us by making sacrifice for us. And this is what Paul says. Love the way Jesus loved, which is sacrificially. And how did he do that? Well, he gave his life up for us. And so we're told to do the same thing. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, we read verse 2 earlier. In verse 1 it says, In view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So to love God means you live as a sacrifice for Him. We love sacrificially if we consider others before ourselves. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. I, I don't know that there's a more counter-cultural statement in all of Scripture for the year 2023 in the United States of America. Consider others as more important than yourselves. <gasps> what? No one is more important than me. No, we love sacrificially. What would it look like for you to live in such a way that you actually believed that you can make the sacrifice, it actually showed up in your life that you would make the sacrifice that other people get to be more important than you? Why do you do that? How can you do that? Does it mean I'm not important? No, 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 no. I live knowing other people are more important than me in this moment, and I can do that with peace and joy because Jesus said I was so important he died for me. So I don't need this moment. I've got eternity. It's a good framework. It's a good perspective. Consider others before yourself. How else do I live sacrificially and love sacrificially? I give when I see a need. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has the world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. In other words, what, what we're seeing here is that to love sacrificially is that if you see a need and you can meet the need, but you don't, that's not an action of love. And we're challenged to live sacrificially and love sacrificially. So here, here's, the, here's the thought. Sacrificial love and sacrificial living is the standard for God's kingdom. It's the standard. I know this isn't like the funnest, like rah rah, power, awesome, everything's gonna work out for you, super cool, tomorrow's gonna be the best day ever sort of sermon. <laughs> but it is the invitation to live in the actual kingdom that Jesus invites us into. And to live in that kingdom is so worth it that it's worth laying down your whole life. It's worth it. And if you're in the kingdom, you know how right I am. And if you're not sure yet, that's okay. Keep hanging out with some people who know how worth it is, worth it it is to live sacrificially and love sacrificially, that their life becomes what Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 2, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. You begin to see that if I can give up my life for God, then he makes my life a sacrificial and fragrant offering pleasing to him. It pleases God when he sees us love others because it proves that we understand the love that we have been given, and it is the most powerful way for us to remain intimate with God and to imitate him, to give our lives like he gave his life for us. 
So if you're familiar with what happens next in Ephesians chapter 5 and moving into chapter 6, you can see how these two verses or this one sentence is a really good setup for what we're going to be studying in the weeks to come. But I think it's also an invitation for us today in the world that we live in right now. Life, life in God's kingdom is about sacrifice for the sake of true love. I mean, think about this. This is not going to be unfamiliar territory to you. The father sacrificed his son because he loved us so much. The kingdom is about sacrifice. The son sacrificed his life to free us from death and sin into life and love. Right? You got into the kingdom because... Jesus made a sacrifice. To enter the kingdom, we imitate God. We sacrifice our lives. We, we come in humbly submitting to his lordship and sacrificing the, the, the leadership of our own life. To remain in God's kingdom, we continue to walk in sacrificial love. Loving God sacrificially, loving others sacrificially, imitating God in this way. And anything that looks like conformity to the world, we sacrifice that. I don't want that. That's not, that's not a part of the life I am trying to live. Truly, we have been called to an ongoing revolution against sin and against a world that rages for us to conform. This is, this is not a boring life. This is revolutionary stuff. This, this is the kind of stuff that if you really do it, is going to get you in trouble with the world. Which is probably why it's easier to just attend church, sing a couple of songs, and go back to your life on Monday. But this is not what we are called to, friends. This is not the church that Jesus is building here in the city or in this season. So let me give you some questions so that you can reflect. I'm going to give you an opportunity to think about some things and then today, we're going to close our service with communion. The first question that I just want to invite you to think about today is, how are you doing at imitating God? I think you probably begin to know some answers to this, but some helpful follow-up questions to that. How are you doing at imitating God? Do you let the ups and downs of life dictate your spirituality? In other words, is it easier for you to love God when life is easy? Are you filled with and led by the Holy Spirit? Are you disciplined or are you driven by emotion? How are you doing at imitating God? How is your love? We're called to walk in love. Do you love the church well? You know, us. The fellow believers. Do you love the ones who are difficult to love or just the ones who look and think and act and vote like you. Who do you look like? Like in a spiritual sense, who do you look like? Do you look like the world and their bondage that masquerades as freedom? Believe these things. You're truly free. Do you look like that? Or are you tied to scripture and truth and life and love in agreement with the word of God? I want to invite you to take a moment to reflect on these questions. They're just going to stay right there for you. And just as, as you reflect, as you think, as you pray, I want to challenge you. Invite the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit of God to convict you where conviction is needed. Keeping in mind that God's conviction is loving and good for us and leads to life and freedom. And, and I want to invite you also to ask God what, what he wants you to do in response to a sermon like this. Is there somebody you need to go talk to? Is there confession that you need to make to a, with a person who will point you back to Jesus? Is there, is there a way you've been living or a thing you've been engaging in that you know is of the world or of your flesh or, or from the devil inspiring you to live in a way that doesn't conform your life to put on Christ? And you need to repent and stop living in that way or engaging in that thing or watching or doing that thing. Jesus, as we think for another moment about these questions, about the call to imitate God and walk in love, God, would you meet us? Would you speak to us today? 
Would you build us more and more into the image of Christ? Would you build your church to look like you, to live like you, to walk like you? And would you give us the strength and the courage to resist the world? I invite you to stay just in this moment a little bit longer. And the next thing that's going to happen today is Pastor Greg's going to come and he's going to lead us into communion as a response physically and spiritually to this moment and to the work of Jesus. I want to invite you to stay. We have an open communion table, which means that if you are a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to take communion with us today. And then Pastor Greg will dismiss us and he'll send us out into the rest of our week. But just right where you're at, one more moment. If there's anything that God is saying to you, listen, pray, repent as it's needed. on what it is that God has put in our heart, where we need to reflect on and stuff. We're going to step at this moment of uh, communion. And so I was uh, been praying and thinking about how we're going to uh, you know, tie our thing in together. And um, I think the Lord is giving me something real simple. We're just a, real, a real simple way to wrap this all up. I want to start off with our, our traditional verse that we always use at communion, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to start down in, in verse 20, 23, second half of it, it says, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, would, I'm sorry, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, um, as we were reflecting on, on these things, and we're called to walk in love and, and called to, to be imitators of, of Christ. I, I want to read another scripture. I was that you, and this is not a very traditional communion scripture, but it, it'll make sense in a minute. Hebrews chapter twelve, and I want to read verse verse two. It says, "Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for who, for." that all over again, sorry. Looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that doesn't sound very traditional for our thing, but as being imitators of Christ and doing this community in remembrance of him. Okay? The verse says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured that shame. He endured that punishment. The joy that was set before him is me and you. He wanted to be with us and have communion with us, have everlasting life with us so much that, you know, he put up with that humiliation. He put up with that pain. He put up with that suffering knowing that there was a joy that was coming ahead of that. And so what I would like to do is, as you know, we're, I'm oh, sorry. Um, can we go ahead and put those, some of those, those, that list back up? As, as we're thinking about the, these different things that are on that, that list, I want to just wrap it up with this. As being imitators of Christ And, and doing this in remembrance of him and what he did. Yes, he died for us. Yes, we have salvation with that. But he did all that for the joy that was before him, which was us. And I think it's appropriate 
that we look forward because the, the crucifixion was in the past and now we're living in that joy. And I think it's appropriate that we walk in that joy. If we're remembering Christ, let's remember his joy and let's remember, let's walk out in joy. In um, Psalms, I believe, 51, David writes, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I just want to pray that the Lord will uh, restore that joy of our salvation. And I believe when we start walking in that joy, in that salvation, a lot of the stuff is going to start coming easier. Right? When you're experiencing joy, it's a lot easier to do a lot of different things. So this is pretty heavy. We had a pretty heavy sermon here. And you know what? But within the heaviness, there's joy. There's hope. And with that joy, with that, now once again, everybody was, you know, I want to just go ahead and say it. Everybody mistakes joy and happiness being synonymous. They're not. Sometimes you can be joyful and you're happy, but you also have joy and not necessarily be happy. And I'm not going to go to the whole sermon on this because we already had a great sermon. So uh, there's a guy on the radio. I don't know who it is, what, even what station it is, but they always says he's talking about things. He goes, this is not a sermon, just a thought. So this is not a sermon, just, just a thought. But let, let, let's, uh, in remembrance of Christ, let's remember that joy that he had for us. That through our salvation. And what is that joy? What did he do for you? Yes, he saved us. But through that salvation, what else have you experienced? Healing? Have you have you uh, financial things, uh, emotional healings? What has he done to that? And that should bring you joy. All the things that he has done, all the provisions and all everything, that should bring a smile to our face. Wow! Yeah. Yes, it, it, it's terrible what they did for him. Yes, we had somber, but it's okay. And so this morning, as you're taking communion and repentance, it'd be proper to. To smile, maybe even have a little giggle or laugh. You know, as you think about the thing that joy that God has done for us and bring that joy of our salvation. You know, this morning I, I want to, I'll close the prayer. I'm doing a two-fold thing: communion and benediction. And I want to combine it. So in a moment, I'm going to pray for our, our, our benediction, and I'm also going to pray for the elements of communion. And our benediction will be when I'm done praying that you would then come. Get your elements, and then in your own way, reflect on God, and take your elements, and then you are dismissed. We do it all at once. So I'll go ahead and start pulling the lids off so we're, we're ready to go when it's time. Thank you, Pastor Mark. So first of all, just uh, bow our heads. Father, as we come before you this morning, and in this time of communion. And as the scripture says, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we are so thankful for what you did. That you laid down your life for us. That through you, you, the shedding of your blood, we had that new covenant. That we had that salvation, Father. But also in remembrance of you is that joy. Because you endured all that for the joy that was set before us. And we are that joy. And Father, we just had that time. And as, as uh, David wrote in the Psalms, restore unto us the joy of your salvation. So Father, right now, we just want to get, we just thank you and praise you for what you've done on the cross, what you've done in our lives, the, the salvation, the Father, the, uh, the healings, the, the provisions, everything that comes along with that. We thank you for that. And as we go through this, and we return that joy of our salvation, that we we'll begin to be able to walk in love. We'll be able to do these things that we were challenged to do, that through joy it would be so much easier. And so, Father, right now, I, once again, as always, I want to say thank you and praise you in advance for the things you're going to do in my life, what you're going to do in our lives, what you do in this church's life, and then the overall church in general. I thank you and praise you, Father, and we look forward to hearing testimonies of how we begin to experience the joys of your salvation, and how we begin to walk in your love, how we begin to become imitators of you, Father, and just uh, to be able to share and rejoice in the things that you're doing in our lives, Father. And right now, in, in benediction, Father, we're going to come in a moment and take communion, but that's benediction. I just pray, Father, you just be with us. 
keep us safe. Father, we're getting ready to uh, have a celebration in a few days uh, of the birth of our nation, Father. I, I just thank you and praise you that we are able to live in this country, Father, that we have the freedoms to gather like this. We have the, the, the privilege that we can come and without fear live for you. And I know there's, they're trying to change things and all that stuff, but Father, we still have those freedoms. And we can openly come here and meet and, and learn about you and praise you and gather together, Father. We won't neglect that, Father. We'll just keep, we'll hang on to that. And I thank you and praise you, Father. I pray right now, Father, that um, you, would, you would continue or, or again bless this nation, that you have mightily blessed this nation. I, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you would continue that blessing regardless of what we do. And, Father, that you would just stir up in our hearts that revival that would start with us. That as you revive us and revive that church, that it would spread out. And as you know, we score the Christmas many times, that you will hear our prayers and you will heal our land, Father. And we just claim that in Jesus' name. And right now, once again, Father, as, as we leave, we give you all praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the, the honor and glory. And we thank you for everything you've done for us, Father. Be with us. Keep us safe. And once again, Father, just as we reflect on you, Again, give us the joy of your salvation. Father, we ask and pray these things in your son's name. Amen.